So just a quick introduction about our presenter today. Uh, we will have uh, Prof. Adrian Todifi from uh, uh, the, is it the University of Pretoria? Yes. That's correct. Yes. Uh, um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a nice new, new angle with uh, so some cheetah work and the title is Understanding Cheetah Metabolism in Disease Through uh, a Systems Biology Approach the first metabolomic study in cheetahs. Um, uh, Dr. Mason has been uh, looking forward to this the whole week. Uh, I have to say I am, I am too. Uh, and we look forward to your presentation. So. Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, I mean, you want me to start? <clears throat> I think you can. Yes, um, well, Do you uh, want to say something? I think else? so. I Jump straight to it because you got you and Catherine who will be presenting. Yeah, yeah so I thought I'd, I'd kind of just lay the sort of um, groundwork and and uh, just discuss why we we sort of why I started on this kind of venture in the first place. And uh, quite a few students, um, Catherine being one of them, has been working on some cheetah related projects that are building on the work that I did for my PhD study. Um, so this goes back probably now at least 10 years when we sort of conceptualized this uh, project. And um, a main reason for looking at cheetahs was because I um, was uh, still employed as a research veterinarian and clinical veterinarian uh, at the National Zoo in Pretoria. Um, and started to see, or I mean, this has been well known since the 1990s, uh, but um, noticed that this, you know, these cheetahs in captivity suffer from a huge number of, um, we call them diseases, but they, I mean, they, they really are sort of almost lifestyle diseases because we, most of them, we have not been able to link to any sort of infectious cause. So um, lymphoplasmacytic gastritis, inflammation of the stomach lining, the glomerular sclerosis, which is a, a renal a lesion, uh, venoocclusive disease of the liver, um, renal amyloidosis, lymphoid depletion in the spleen, adrenal hyperplasia, pancreatitis, and then various different other neurological diseases, encephalomyelopathy. I mean, and even uh, uh, right at the bottom there, I think it's one of the only species in which they've actually found all the key uh, post-mortem elements of Alzheimer's disease in the brain uh, in one study in Japan from captive cheetahs. So actually the only species that we know of other than humans that has shown um, evidence of Alzheimer's disease um, where it's not been sort of experimentally been induced. And what is really um, quite interesting here is if you just now, this is a, quite an old study already, but it looked at um, the incidence of many of these diseases in captive cheetahs, both in South Africa and then North America um uh the north american population over here and what you can very clearly see there is just look at the numbers over here in terms of the incidence so 99 percent of the animals examined at post-mortem had lymphoplasmacytic gastritis and that's pretty much the same in both populations if we look at glomerular sclerosis over here 81 percent so these are very very high disease incidences um, and, you know, really a lot of work has gone to this, but but after 30 years, we really have no clue. We didn't have a clue as to what was causing these problems. Now, we initially, I mean, there are sort of three main, um, shall we say, hypotheses or uh, areas of, of interest. Um, the genetics, obviously, for the cheetah. Cheetah is, is one of the species that became famous for its level of inbreeding depression and has been used as an example of, you know, the bottleneck that they've gone through this by a work done by Stephen O'Brien um, back in the 1980s. And um, that sort of popularized this kind of idea that the, the cheetah is highly inbred, very little genetic variation between individuals. And it was initially thought that a lot of these diseases were really related to this inbreeding um, and the bottleneck that they went uh, several thousand years, years ago. 
the only problem that we have is that in the wild, we actually disease is a very um, uh, low incidence in most populations. Um, actual, I don't think anywhere in the world uh, is, you know, there's a situation where cheetahs have suffered significantly from disease and uh, any local extinctions have been due to human uh, issues and com competition with, you know, uh, with humans for um, uh, with poaching and, and that sort of thing uh, being the primary uh, problem. Um, very rare to see any sort of uh, issues related to disease in wild populations. Um, and many of the diseases that we are talking about, you know, that occur in captivity uh, are very rare in the wild population. And therefore, um, you know, you would expect then, okay, are, are our captive population really inbred, but the, all our genetic studies that have been done show that the levels of um, uh, genetic variation in wild populations are completely comparable with the captive population. So that really was becoming less and less likely that the, the main problem was, was the, the genetics. Um, then sort of around the early 2000s, the idea of stress uh, was put forward and it really gained momentum with a publication in 2004 from Corin Terrier in, in the US, where she showed the difference between the adrenal glands of captive uh, cheetahs, these very large adrenal glands over here compared to adrenal glands uh, from wild cheetahs. Now, and, and that really has become quite popular. I mean, in terms of even, you know, I've got researchers that I work with at the moment that still believe that stress is the primary cause of many of the issues that uh, captive cheetahs face. And um, the only problem that I have with this is that I've done ultrasound on captive cheetahs in Namibia, um, where they are not in a typical zoo environment, but they are in captivity, and they have, um, you know, fairly normal adrenal glands and comparable sizes to uh, the adrenal glands of, of completely wild cheetahs. Um, these uh, really large adrenal glands are mainly from zoo animals um, and at post-mortem and, and it's very difficult to then say for sure that that animal died without going through a stressful period before its death. I mean, they selected animals that so-called died suddenly without any obvious period of disease, which would have significantly increased their level of stress. But again, this is based on post-mortem data. And uh, I think it really is not something that carries across the board in terms of the epidemiology of these problems. Um, so these... Uh, the cheetahs in Namibia that I examined with ultrasound um, to look at the adrenal size, gland sizes, many of them had gastritis, many of them had renal disease, um, but their adrenal glands were absolutely normal size and they did not come into contact with any uh, keepers or visitors, zoo visitors. They were just in fairly large camps, but the only thing was that they were being fed um, you know, an, a, a diet mainly uh, made up of, of donkey meat because that is relatively easy to obtain. Um, has hasn't really got an economic value, and um, and that was being fed to to these cheetahs, and many of them, as I said, had um, sort of gastritis and renal issues. Um, so that's really leaves focus the focus um, certainly from my research and a few others around the world has been on the nutrition aspect of this. Um, the, and uh, quite a few publications have come out, but it hasn't really changed um, the perceptions out there as to you know what the, the causes of these diseases are. So um, even though some of these publications are now quite a few years old, uh, this area hasn't really gained momentum in terms of, of um, new research and, and novel ideas. So just in terms of um, wild cheetahs, uh, in terms of what they eat, um, they really are quite specialists in terms of their diet. They will only 95% uh, of their diet is made up of small antelope, small to medium sized antelope. Um, and they, they hunt primarily during the day, uh, although that does depend on, on the other predators. And cheetahs are usually solitary, although you may get a coalition like in this picture over here, a coalition of males. Um, and when they hunt, they will, you know, after hunting, they will eat the entire carcass. Um, including the skin, the bones, and um, often only leaving the head and the feet. They often don't eat the actual rumen and the small intestine or the, or the, the entire intestine. Often they start off, it's a very interesting the way in which they eat. They often will eat a, a small part of the muscle meat on the, on the hind quarters. Then they will open up the abdomen. They then carefully remove the rumen, depending on the size of the antelope, in very small 
um, antelope or, or, or youngsters, they might just eat the whole carcass uh, without um, actually trying to remove uh, their rumen and intestine. It's thought that they then carefully pull the rumen out and often even drag it to one side um, before continuing to eat all of the other internal organs. And the reason they think is, you know, it makes sense that if you puncture the rumen, um, it gives off quite a, a strong distinct smell and that would attract other carnivores, uh, which then would come and steal, you know, the, the, the food from, from the cheetah. So um, they, they seem to do that to avoid uh, attracting, you know, so they, they have to eat very, very quickly. They don't drag their prey up into a tree like leopards do. They eat on the ground and uh, consume most of that within uh, an hour or two, um, often not completely eating the whole carcass, uh, you know, if, uh, if it's a large in, in you know, larger prey, um, they are quite selective in terms of what they go for, often going for the, the organs, but very importantly, they eat most of the skin. Um, and the other thing to then point out is unlike leopards, they don't eat a lot of birds or warthogs or you know, other monogastric animals. Uh, almost all of their diet comes from um, these antelope, which are ruminants. And we'll get to why that is important a little later on. But if you look at just the, the complexity of their diet, um, they're only getting up to about 50% of, of the diet is muscle meat. And then the other 50% is made up of skin, uh, bone, internal organs. Um, so um, uh, whereas in captivity, and then there are many reasons for this, their diet is largely made up of muscle meat. So often they are fed horse meat or uh, donkey meat or uh, meat from cattle um, that uh, are being condemned at a, you know, uh, or, um, you know, for, for human consumption. Um, horse meat, obviously not something that's consumed in Southern Africa, uh, donkeys neither. So often older horses that have kind of uh, are euthanized uh, sh or shot, um, that meat will be made of available to many carnivores uh, in S South Africa, including cheetahs. Now, the, the difference between obviously those, firstly, a horse is a monogastric animal. And secondly, it has, it's much larger than the typical prey of, of cheetahs. And so they would, um, you know, uh, not be able to consume the bones and often when an animal like this is slaughtered they exsanguinate the, the, the carcass so they bleed it out the blood is actually removed um, and the skin is taken off um, and often the internal organs are thrown away um, because they often do not last very long they can't be put into a freezer or into a cold storage you know and maintained for longer periods of time um, so the other thing that is different is that in the wild cheetahs will often hunt every three to four days um, so they have this definite sort of feast and fast cycle, whereas in captivity, the standard sort of operating procedure is to feed cheetahs six days a week with a single starve day. Um, so they are being fed a lot more often than they would normally eat uh, in, in the wild. So, uh, you know, in order to try and really understand exactly how, I mean, you, you think that these are, it's just a big cat. So we, we know a lot about cats and their metabolism and how they function. And you would think that um, that would be true, but actually it turns out really, we actually know very little about these animals and their, their digestion and metabolism. Um, and I wanted to really try and get a good handle on that. So we decided to go for a systems biology approach, really, you know, um, nail down some basics and obviously metabolomics lends itself to, to that kind of understanding. No, um, metabolomics, uh, actual studies in veterinary science are still very rare today. Um, there are a few studies that have been done in dogs. Many of the other studies that are done on animals are done in mice. Um, but if you look at uh, any wildlife, I mean, it's actually very rare. I mean, obviously, metabolomics is now being used f um, to monitor sort of environmental uh, changes and environmental toxicity. Um, but if you look at individual species um, and metabolomics, you know, the studies are, are still very, very rare. And there is no actual foundation of knowledge or um, that we can, you know, really build on. So the aim for my PhD was really to just try and set the stage or to just get a baseline of information and then to, to develop uh, an understanding of um, uh, differences between sort of captive and wild cheetahs um, over time. So mainly I uh, used uh, GCMS um, initially, uh, certainly for the urine organic um, acids. And uh, we got some very nice profiles. I had um, a group of, of captive cheetahs initially. Most of them were captive uh, for the initial part of the study. Um, and 
uh, it, the reason I didn't include a lot of wild cheetahs is because um, of the initially because the samples that were collected were collected by other people other than myself uh, for the wild cheetahs, and many of them, um, the, the serum samples at least, were were hemolyzed, um, so that created a bit of a, a challenge. And secondly, um, the researchers that collect from wild cheetahs did, often didn't, you know, collect urine. Um, it's it can be a little bit. I mean, it's usually very easy to collect urine, but m even many veterinarians um, in the field are a little reluctant to collect a urine sample, even though it takes, you know, literally two minutes to do. Um, and then, you know, those samples needed to be properly stored and frozen and so on before they could um, be analyzed. But anyway, we've got some nice profiles um, from 41 apparently healthy adult captive cheetahs in Namibia. Um, we did the GCMS an analysis and got 339 organic acids um, on the profile. Obviously, didn't you know um, have a look at all of those. Some things were quite obvious uh, right from the start. There were many, many phenolic compounds uh, on the uh, that were in high, relatively high concentrations. These uh, appear to be mainly produced by, at this stage, I, I even see it, it still says colonic bacterial fermentation. Yeah, my uh, view on that has changed. Now I'm pretty much sure that that bacterial fermentation is not taking place in the colon, but is actually in the captive cheetahs taking place in the small intestine, which is actually part of the disease process. And um, these aromatic amino acids, uh, phenylalanine, tyrosine, um, and tryptophan are then being fermented uh, and the fermentation products are absorbed by the from the intestine into the bloodstream and then they have to be like any drug they have to be metabolized um, to render them non-toxic and to be able to excrete them from uh, through the urine um, so this is uh, you know quite interesting um, was that many of those phenolic compounds were being um, metabolized through glycine conjugation um, and which is quite odd because uh, it, it was always thought that domestic cats really are pretty poor at glycine conjugation um, and it's one of the reasons why they are particularly susceptible to the toxicity of something like benzoic acid um, which gets converted uh, through the addition of glycine to hippuric acid um, and they actually develop um, a severe, what I believe to be uh, hyperammonemia, so high ammonia levels in the blood due to inhibition of the urea. So it's quite, it was quite strange to suddenly in another feel it to see these, these high concentrations of, of glycine conjugates in the urine. Um, another, th th you can see the two peaks over here, 12 and 15, extremely high concentrations of two compounds that were novel. Um, the first one we identified uh, metabolite, uh, which again, as I said, high concentrations. And then in my initial uh, publications, we, I think 15 was still unknown, um, but I've subsequently figured out uh, what it's likely to be. Um, and then things like uh, pantothenic acids, tremelic acid, um, correlated negatively uh, with age, whereas glutaric acid uh, positively with age of the, of the captive cheetahs. And this pointed to some progressive dysregulation of the coenzyme A uh, metabolism, which, which I'll discuss a little bit more in a, a little later. What was really a problem right from the start, however, was a tenfold variation in the urine creatinine excretion. Um, now, that created problems, obviously, because normally in concentrations relative to the creatinine that's excreted. And um, in humans, it's obviously believed, let me just get onto that. I'll, I'll come, sorry, let me, I'll come to the creatinine issue in a moment as well. Um, we are just show you some of the, of the different concentrations and uh, why that is interesting. This was just, um, then, okay, there's the unknown 362, and that was our new cadaverine metabolite. Um, the cadaverine metabolite uh, was basically methylated twice to give this in one in five dimethyl um, pentane, one five diamine um, compound. Uh, that was interesting because it's going to actually eat up quite a lot of your methylation uh, reactions um, just to metabolize it. Again, it's, it's uh, lysine that's probably uh, being uh, the amino acid lysine, which is then fermented into cadaverine by bacteria again in the gut. And here I've indicated sort of a colon over here, but it, it, it really is very likely that that is happening in the small intestine rather than in the, the large intestine. Um, and then this unknown 362, 
Um, we've now sort of figured out that it's probably in, in isobutyrol glutamate, which is quite interesting because I think Marley has done some uh, work on um, NAGIS uh, uh, issues um, in born areas of metabolism where you get these uh, very high concentrations of these uh, uh, acids, organic acids. Um, and they detected this in as isobutyrol glutamate um, in cases of um, Nagus uh, inhibition in, in, in relatively low concentrations in the urine. Well, now we in the cheetahs are finding it very, very high concentration. So it is very likely that too, we're getting inhibition of uh, in acetyl glutamate synthase um, and therefore getting a buildup of this in isobutyrol glutamate um, in, the, in the urine. And that means that these animals are probably have quite severe suppression of the urea cycle. Um, so that would be, uh, you know, quite a concern. All right, coming back to creat creatinine. Um, so this is just a, showing the different age of the cheetahs uh, and the males and males in red and the females in blue. And then this is just the absolute urine concentration of creatinine. Now, what is interesting to hear is firstly, there seems to be an age related decline, which I mean, we seem to see in humans and it was often argued that in humans, um, this decline is due to you know, loss of muscle mass. Um, and then in humans, you'd also say that males would excrete more uh, creatinine in their urine because they have a greater muscle mass. Now, the, yes, you know, in, in uh, cheetahs, the sexes are quite dimorphic in terms of size. Females are quite a lot smaller than males. And yet, yeah, you can see that at least three of these females have much higher concentrations of uh, creatinine in their urine. Uh, just to put it into perspective as well, that so humans would normally be excreting, you know, around about 20 millimole per litre of creatinine, so right down the bottom over here. Um, and remember that humans would also weigh uh, about double what, a, what an average cheetah would weigh, and yet these cheetahs are excreting massive amounts of, of creatinine um, in the urine. The other thing just to point out, and, and this was now, was I going to actually uh, correct the urine concentrations given this kind of variation, um, and I eventually decided not to. The primary reason is that humans obviously drink water and other fluids uh, recreationally and for for pleasure, not, uh, not uh, simply for, you know, for thirst. Whereas most animals will regulate their um, very fine, you know, their, their water intake is is very finely regulated um, by the osmotic changes in the bloodstream, and so they're really not going to just drink for for pleasure sake or because they like the taste of water. So it's very unlikely that the urine concentration is going to change that much um, over time. And looking at this, I, I had to give up on the idea of using creatinine um, because it was going to, we're going to end, end up um, uh, with very abnormal uh, concentrations of of the other metabolites that we're trying to. Um, you know, trying to understand the concentrations. So I just did a few sums then just in terms of looking at this creatinine excretion. Obviously, creatinine comes from creatine. Cheetahs uh, eat a lot of meat and meat will contain large amounts of creatine. So the potential is uh, looking at the daily intake, they probably could get roughly around three grams of creatine per day in the diet. Um, that seems like quite a lot actually, but um, they actually manufacture creatine in the body themselves. It's, um, if you know the, the biochemistry here, it comes from two um, amino acids, arginine and glycine, um, that are converted to guanidine acetate and ornithine in the kidneys. And then that uh, then moves to the liver where you get the methylation reaction. Um, and either you then need methionine for that. Um, and then you get creatine created in the liver, which then is then available to the muscles for um, and to other organs, uh, the nervous system and so on for energy um, regulation. Now, um, creatine then obviously is broken down in the muscles to uh, creatinine, and that is then uh, transported back to the kidneys where it is then excreted. And um, if you then look at your creatinine excretion in the cheetahs, we're getting anything from one to 12 grams per day. So at the higher end of the scale, you, know, you can understand that actually these cheetahs may be manufacturing somewhere up to nine grams of creatinine per day, which is tremendous. As I said, uh, the, the amount of uh, creatinine excreted, I think in, in uh, uh, 
high performance human athlete uh, male would be probably maximum about two grams per day. So this is substantially more. Um, and this is quite interesting just to look at the understand what is going on. Why are they actually producing so much creatine and creatinine, um, the, the waste product from that? Now, one of the things is why can cheetahs run so fast? Um, and this is, uh, uh, you know, they obviously have various anatomical adaptations that make them, you know, uh, they, they give them the ability to be able to run so fast. But I believe that one of the main reasons why they can run so fast is because they are using primarily creatine, creatine phosphate cycles to generate the energy to be able to run at very, very high speeds for very short periods of time. Now, normally, if you had to run um, a 100 meter sprint, you'd be burning up all your creatine uh, or energy from creatine, creatine phosphate within the first two seconds, if you're lucky, whereas we believe that these cheetahs probably can maintain, you know, um, very high speeds for up to 30, 30 seconds before they have to switch over to glycolysis, and which they were pretty bad at. And, um, you know, therefore, uh, they tire pretty quickly. So um, if they don't catch that antelope within that first 30 seconds, uh, they, they cannot keep up the pace, and they will have to stop running um, and it's been shown that it's definitely not because they build up um, body heat. Uh, the temperatures hardly go up by more than about one degree Celsius during those high speed, speed, speed chases. Now, the sort of evidence, you know, as to uh, that this is possibly true for most felid species, we catch these black footed cats, the smallest of the cat species in the Karoo, and the way in which we catch them. Now, they don't go into traps very easily, so the only way we can catch them is to chase them down with a, a vehicle with, at night. Fortunately, the crew is nice and flat, and we can get reach you know speeds of up to 60 kilometers an hour um, out in the felt. And these uh, small little cats run uh, probably at about 60 kilometers an hour, which is quite impressive given the short legs, but um, they tire very, very quickly. The females will only run about 500 meters and the males will run about 800 meters. And then they are absolutely exhausted and you can jump out of the vehicle, put a net over them and then hand inject them um, so that you can then collect samples, put a radio collar on and so on uh, as part of the scientific research. They, they, they recover fully during the anesthetic and um, the chase doesn't seem to have any sort of negative effects on them. Um, one evening whilst we were out in the Karoo, I decided we, we came across a female caracal and decided we would want to at least get from, for disease surveillance purposes, get some samples from her. And we thought, well, let's see if we can catch the caracal in the same way. This female only ran about 500 meters. And I and, uh, thought, well, you know, knowing the aggression of a caracal, it, you know, we would have a problem. But we were able to walk up to her, put a net over her, hand inject her, uh, collect the samples, and then you know wake her up and, and release her. So again, just pointing to the fact that actually, yeah, something that I don't think anybody else has really noticed is that uh, these felids seem to be um, functioning primarily on creatine, creatine phosphate, and then glycolysis and beta oxidation as uh, are very much secondary. Um, methods of, of uh, producing energy. So they are high speed uh, sprint athletes, but they're certainly not endurance athletes because they obviously can't run. And most of the chase actually then would be, um, uh, you know, sort of an anaerobic kind of uh, chase where they wouldn't really require huge amounts of oxygen. Um, so the interesting thing there just is that, um, to point out is that if you need that large amount of creatine, you're going to need uh, the three amino acids uh, glycine, arginine, and uh, methionine. Methionine and arginine are very abundant in meat, um, so those wouldn't be a problem. But the glycine is the interesting one because it's not found at high concentrations in muscle meat, but it certainly is found in other collagen-containing uh, tissues. So the second thing was just, okay, we're using a lot of glycine for the creatine production, but then coming back to the these... Um, these uh, xenobiotic sort of secondary metabolites uh, from uh, the fermentation of uh, phenylalanine, tyrosine, uh, in particular from the aromatic amino acids. Um, and you can just see this is now the top um, 30 in terms of concentration um, organic acids in that we found in the urine of uh, these captive cheetahs. And yeah, just to highlight in in red, you know, just showing you how many of these actually come from enteric bacterial uh, fermentation of, um, um, you know, the amino acids. And then if you just look across here, you'll see how many of them contain glycine. So what's coming, becoming obvious is that they just need huge amounts of actual glycine um, as part of their metabolism. 
Um, yeah, we can just go through. We've identified many of these compounds and whether they are broken down metabolically in the in the body or whether they come from uh, from bacteria fermentation, but quite a host of different um, uh, secondary products, um, secondary metabolites. And some of these uh, are biologically active um, and then have to be, you know, uh, well, some of these. Um, perhaps having effects, which I'm going to discuss uh, also in a moment. So quite a number of them actually have uh, been shown to have some effect on um, this particular this enzyme, um, enzyme which is responsible for the recycling um, of BH4. Um, and that plays an important role in the metabolism of uh, the aromatic amino acids uh, which then form L-dopa, which is a precursor of dopamine, noradrenaline, obviously, and adrenaline. On the other side, tryptophan, which then is responsible for the production of, was needed for the production of serotonin. Um, now, those these are all quite difficult to actually measure in the blood um, because they have a half-life that is very, very short, less than a minute in most cases. And um, they are then metabolized by the monoamine oxidases into some um, products which are excreted in the urine, and you'll probably be aware of these homovanillic acid and vanillal mandelic acid. And these, however, we can measure, you know, in, in the urine, and um, that was also quite interesting. Here are just a few graphs which uh, I to show you are of interest. So these are many of these um, breakdown products of the aromatic amino acids, um, various different types of compounds. And then I've just plotted them against, um, on the graph, the concentration of VMA and HVA, the vanillin, mandelic acid, and homovanillic acid. And what you can see here in all of them is that there's varying degrees of a pattern, uh, you know, emerging where um, sort of a negative uh, correlation, the higher the concentrations of the dopamine breakdown products, dopamine and, and uh, noradrenaline products, um, the lower the concentration of the actual um, aromatic amino acid metabolite, the, 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 the phenolic compound. Um, which which is then quite interesting. Um, if I had actually two wild cheetahs that I collected myself, um, urine from as well, unfortunately, very low number. But if you now look at the, the them those individuals compared to the captive cheetahs, um, so this would never be statistically significant, obviously, but it is of interest, um, just if you look at it. So yeah, are many of the uh, phenolic compounds, uh, their concentrations fairly high in the captive uh, animals and very, very low um, of varying degrees. But And then here yeah, is just the, uh, the concentrations, average concentrations in the free ranging of uh, uh, cheetahs uh, in blue, the vanillal mandelic acid and homovanillic acid are higher than the, the, the captive cheetahs. So that suggests that they may be, some of these um, actual compounds might have a, a direct effect on uh, dopamine production. And obviously we think of dopamine very much in terms of the brain, but what very few people understand or realize is that actually dopamine is found in much higher concentrations in the gut um, and that dopamine deficiencies have, uh, and, and abnormalities with regards to dopamine um, in the gut have, have quite so, um, Dopamine is needed to increase gastric motility. It reduces the risk of ulceration, um, modulates the secretions, and increases the blood flow to the gut. And then in the kidney, you get regulation of blood pressure, loss of sodium, regulation of the renin and tensin aldosterone system, modulation of the COX-2 expression, and then the modulation of, of various prostaglandins. And what is quite interesting is that in, in humans that have diabetes, um, they develop a particular, I mean, you get di diabetic nephropathy um, as a result of, of uh, chronic, you know, unregulated or uncontrolled diabetes. The lesion that we see in cheetahs, glomerular sclerosis, that we see is very similar to the lesion that we see in di di diabetic patients, uh, uh, diabetic nephropathy. But clearly the cheetahs don't have diabetes. And um, so it may be that there's some mechanism that is shared, uh, and we suggest here that um, a decrease in renal dopamine production uh, as a possible cause and the impairment of the intrarenal dopaminergic system might be um, something that is present in both diabetic humans and in, in many cheetahs. Then another interesting thing, um, this is uh, also done work done at uh, Northwest University by 
Christoph Bardenhorst, um, where he showed that the, the new perspective on glycine conjugation um, and the metabolism of aromatic acids. And you would, if you know something about this, you know the phenolic compounds that are how they're metabolized through um, being um, bound to coenzyme A. Um, and then uh, to form these acyl coenzyme A thioesters. Now, interestingly, this in the humans, um, rats, and so on, uh, that's, this process takes place both in the kidneys and in the liver. But in all of our felid species, it's very likely that this actually only happens in the kidney. Now, these, these acyl coenzyme A thioesters are highly reactive, they cause a lot of damage. And um, but that's normally not too much of a problem because if you've got plenty of glycine around, you can. You know, the glycine then uh, is conjugated to the uh, um, compound and then you, you get releasing of the coenzyme A and um, you've, you've got a, a fairly uh, benign compound that then can be uh, glycine conjugate that then can be excreted in the urine. Um, now, the problem is that if you don't have enough glycine, have you, you've got two problems. One, you've got this acyl coenzyme A thioester that persists um, and could potentially cause ongoing renal damage. And then the other problem is that you've got sequestration of coenzyme A as it remains bound up in that molecule and is no longer available for many other um, you know, energy-related activities in the, in the body. And this is one of the main reasons why I think felids are developing kidney damage is because of an underlying glycine deficiency. Um, and it's at the same time, an increased production of phenolic compounds by bacteria in the small intestine that shouldn't actually be there um, in large numbers. And, um, and then these acyl coenzyme A thioesters are causing quite a lot of damage. And in captive cheetahs, we know that they develop uh, progressive renal failure in most captive cases and, and probably the vast majority of captive cheetahs eventually die of kidney failure. Um, just another interesting one here, uh, another um, thing that we noticed was that the relationship with, between urine creatinine and pyroglutamic acid and pyroglutamic acid is a, um, a product of glutathione. Um, and there was a positive correlation between the urine creatinine uh, and um, pyroglutamic uh, and and uh, pyroglutamic acid, um, and possibly the reason for that positive uh, correlation is again related to glycine because glycine is needed for the production of glutathione as well um, as for creatine. So now you can start to see a picture building as why we focused really on on glycine needed for creatine synthesis. Uh, glutathione synthesis, porphyrin synthesis, purine synthesis, production of bile acids, conjugation of xenobiotics. It's a pretty important um, amino acid in the body, the modulation of methylation, um, and obviously as a, a neurotransmitter, um, inhibitory neurotransmitter. Um, but the production of glycine is quite uh, interesting um, because it, it's uh, can come from serine and threonine, but there are quite a few studies that have now shown that this reaction from serine is actually very limited. Um, and uh, in this study, uh, they showed that most humans um, would uh, probably be suffering from a, a glycine deficiency of up to about 10 grams per day for a 70 kilogram uh, adult. Um, this was just based done, done looking at the rate at which serine can be converted to glycine to provide the glycine needs if you don't have it uh, in the diet. And obviously the cheetah, this might be substantially higher than the 10 grams um, given the amount of creatinine and the amount of uh, glycine conjugation that takes place in the species. So anyway, so there's what you might expect for a um, glycine deficiency. Uh, creatine, coming back to it, just um, in terms of, uh, it's not only just there in the muscles, it's also in many other tissues in the body. Um, and um, the skeletal muscle, the brain, obviously, if you have a, a creatine, if you can't synthesize creatine in the body, then uh, you have to take it as a supplement and it has quite a detrimental um, effect on uh, you know brain function, um, also the heart. But then also less known is the ear and eye. Um, in rat studies, they've shown that creatine supplementation improves hearing in, in certain types of hearing loss uh, because the fine um, filaments in the ear that are responsible for detecting sound waves, uh, their energy source seems to come from creatine. Sperm, almost entirely functional uh, function on creatine, using it for energy to, to swim um, rather than uh, glucose. And then one that's very little known is about the gastric parietal cells uh, which produce the hydrochloric acid um, in the stomach. 
Um, so th this is a parietal cell. In humans, it's quite interesting. Uh, the volume of mitochondria in the parietal cell, about 40% of the cell volume uh, is taken up by mitochondria, and that's more than any other cell in the body. So in terms of energy consumption, it seems the parietal cell is the most hungry for energy, and that's to drive these proton pumps, pushing out chlor chloride ions and hydrogen ions, um, and um, intensive energy process um, that requires a lot of ATP to drive these uh, these proton pumps. Now, it's if the cheetah is going to be using a lot of creatine to drive its muscle physiology and enable it to run so fast, it does make sense that it's not going to have a completely different system in the stomach. Uh, very likely that this system in the stomach is going to also function um, based on, uh, on, on creatine and that at a creatine deficiency, you might end up with a um, hydrochloric acid um, production loss, which um, then has major potential issues. Because um, one of the main things about that hydrochloric acid is needed for, um, together with the main uh, enzyme pepsin in the stomach, is for protein digestion. And you can imagine that an animal that eats a huge amount of protein um, is going to, to need a, a very good production of hydrochloric acid because pepsin actually only functions properly at, uh, at pH of uh, you know, two, as soon as the pH rises to above five, pepsin is no longer active and you get a, get a, get a maldigestion uh, issue. Um, and that certainly seems to be what's happening. So in, in our cheetahs, so hyperchlorhydria, where pH is above 2.5, you get reduced bactericidal effects because the, the, the actual acid destroys many of our pathogenic bacteria. It acts as a, buff, a, a barrier to um, ingestion of pathogenic ba bacteria. There might be an increased risk of uh, bacteria like Helicobacter establishing in the stomach if they don't have enough stomach acid and salmonella um, infections. There will be excessive gastrin production um, due to a lack of negative feedback. You might get an overgrowth of uh, bacteria in the small intestine. And then remember, we talked about the, the, the fermentation that potentially can take place because the pH is too high. Um, and uh, normally that pH would be a severe limiting factor to the growth of bacteria in the small intestine. Pro proteins not denatured, poorly digested. And then uh, we talked about this fermentation of the aromatic amino acids. But you also get other possible problems like the reduced absorption of calcium, magnesium, iron, and zinc, and as well as some of the vitamins. So really, we have this these few problems that could all um, result from a glycine deficiency, and that then leads into uh, very much into uh, Catherine's um, talk, which we're going to uh, she'll give in a, in a moment. Um, so really just many, many different parts of the animal's health that are going to be potentially affected. Just to also mention chronic inflammation because glycine regulates the, the immune system in very much the same way that it has a depressing effect on the um, neuro nervous system. Um, and um, so if you don't have enough glycine, you might have an overactive uh, immune system that is going to then lead to, to chronic uh, inflammation as well. And then I've mentioned many of these, which you know, you, I'm not gonna go through in, in detail. And then just finally, just um, last couple of slides, just wanted to mention that we didn't just look at the organic acids. We also looked at some of the fatty acids. Um, and here I had some comparative data between free ranging captive cheetahs uh, this was published in PLUS One, and um, very nice sample sizes, which are very comparable. It was like chalk and cheese, really. If you look at these p-values, the differences just across the board of various different, I've just summarized a few of the most important um, fatty acids here. And the striking difference was really that the captive uh, cheetahs in terms of uh, polyunsaturated fats, so the total polyunsaturated fats, if you look over here, um, captive cheetahs, 1,183 versus the free ranging cheetahs, it was only 363. And again, remember we talked about the fact that they eat mainly small antelope, whereas in captivity, they're being fed monogastric animals, which have a much higher polyunsaturated fat content than the ruminants. Ruminants convert the polyunsaturated fats to saturated fats. Um, 
And this then potentially, uh, you know, increases the chances of oxidative um, damage because polyunsaturated fats, as you will know, uh, are sensitive to uh, oxidative uh, damage. And the cheetahs don't seem to be adapted at all to that kind of situation. And then remember that we've also got a decreased glutathione, which is the main antioxidant in the body. So now you're actually hitting this animal from two sides by fe feeding it a high uh, polyunsaturated fat diet, increasing its the oxidative damage, but at the same time reducing its glutathione because it doesn't have enough glycine. And um, you can then get uh, inflammation. So this was just the um, other study that we did. Interestingly here, uh, the cosohexanoic acid, the um, uh, long chain uh, omega-3 fatty acids um, that are important on, on supplemented in humans, we did not detect any levels of them in the blood, but it's possibly because they are really producing that in their brain themselves. They don't need the supplementation as long as they don't have a high polyunsaturated fat intake, which would then you know, eat up all the delta-6 desaturase. So that if you look at the desaturase index over here, you can see that there's quite a dramatic difference between the captive and the free-ranging cheetahs as well. So there's a real risk of oxidative damage and impaired fatty acid metabolism in, in captive cheetahs, potentially. And that's a very fast um, run through most of this. I hope I've left enough time for, um, for Catherine still to, to present her. Uh, presentation, but yeah, happy to perhaps take questions after she's done that. Thanks so much, Prof. Adrian. Um, may I ask just for, if, you, if you can add one more slide at the end of your presentation with your email address? Oh, uh, yes. We, yeah, I think it was on my, on my first slide. Uh, I okay. think I had my, had my email address under my name on the, okay, on yeah. the, the cover slide. I think, I think just bring up that slide because we're going to upload this to YouTube. And I think uh, great. Um, let me just know, let me just get back to the present. I think I've stopped sharing now. So let me just. I'll just present it one more time because we, we encourage communication with our presenters, and I think yeah, a lot of people who watch this on the YouTube channel are going to be very interested in this and what you have done because you are obviously a very knowledgeable man of cheetahs and even more that metabolism. So I've been impressed. I've I've worked with Prof Yopi Mini. And I've been impressed with this amount of knowledge of metabolism and yours. I say <laughs> it's, clo it's close to equaling, equaling that very soon. So you are quite there knowledgeable. And I, what I envision is what you what yep. you really need is David Attenborough. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, I've I've spent fifteen years now thinking about this problem and um, trying to solve it, and found actually very few. You know, collaborators, um, Tasha, I see is in, in, yeah, is, is one of the few people who's, uh, you know, been able to really get on board with this. And um, so I'm sure once you sort of present this to people, they something, you know, they realize just, just okay, this is something really novel. I mean, I'm mean, hoping, I said, if I had one nature paper and hopefully Tasha and I will get there, it will be to show why the cheetah runs so fast and that it's actually not so much about the anatomical adaptations on which quite a number of things have been published, but, but the actual metabolism of the animal, which is far more uh, impressive, uh, I think. Um, so yes, we, we, we're still hoping for that. There's a little bit of work that's that's going in, and we we've already done some studies with uh, with Lukman, one one of his MSc students, which is fabulous. Just looking at uh, creatinine kinase um, in cheetah muscle uh, cells, and um, but we 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 you know we've still got a little bit of work to do before we get that Nature paper done. <laughs> okay, uh, well, I think we should definitely contact BBC and ask. Um, David Attenborough to be in contact with you and just share this in a documentary because the amount of information you've collected <laughs> is amazing. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you very much. So there, there's there's my um, email address at the bottom of the. Are there anyone um, anyone in the audience? Um, I know Elsa has worked with you in the past. Maybe she might have a question or two related to this. But is anyone in the audience that would like to ask a question? You can either raise your hand or ask a question in the chat box. I do encourage it. And with all the, the, the journal clubs that we do, I encourage the Metabolism South Africa. And usually there's quite a few um, views afterwards. Um, yeah, I mean, 100 I think to 200. Do. Yeah. Mm. My actual metabolomics knowledge and, you know, um, is, is probably a little bit far more limited than many people. I'm, I'm sure that, you know, your colleagues on that side. So, you know, any any ideas, any uh, interesting 
um, comments or, or assistance. I mean, identifying some of these unknown compounds, that is, you know, it seems to me the, the biggest challenge in many cases and uh, has baffled quite a few people. And uh, I've, I've needed quite a lot of help um, to be able to start on that, but there's still many other compounds that I still haven't identified yet. Yes, and what we did, we did miss your, your bio around the beginning. So just to okay. people who are listening on YouTube channel that um, Prof. Adrian, he, he does come in from a, a strong veterinarian background. So he That's goes to MSc in um, mammal, African Mammalogy at the Mammal Research Institute at University of Pretoria and spent many years at the National Zoology, Zoolo Zoological Gardens in Africa as a clinical In science at University of Pretoria, where he's now an associate professor and the director of the under support veterinary academic hospital. So he is a very busy man. Um, attained his PhD in 2017, and since 2019, you know, he's been registered at the African Veterinarian Society or committee, um, part of the ethics groups as well. He's a C2 rated scientist. Um, and yeah, most of his current research focuses on management and welfare of captive and wild carnivores, as you have seen in the presentation. So it's quite an impressive bio. So anyone who is listening from YouTube channels um, and you are interested in collaborating with this man, please get in contact with him because he is a very interesting man to get involved with. And he's always open to collaboration, I believe. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thanks very much, Shane. I don't see any questions, but thank you so much, Prof. Adrian. We, we're going to stop this recording so that we can um, start a new recording for um, Catherine's talk.